clinical implications for intraoperative dislocation of the hip unnecessary for other procedures I think are significant. Um, hips are not made to dislocate and when a hip dislocates there is an element of soft tissue damage that is unavoidable. Rather that's imposed by you as the surgeon or uh, experienced secondarily by the patient just as a consequence of the dislocation. Not having to dislocate the hip uh, intraoperatively I think allows again for tissue sparing which plays into the rapid recovery aspect of SuperPath. The more tissue that is spared, uh, including muscles around the hip joint, I think the better the patient is short term, but long term as well, because those mus muscles continue to function in a normal fashion. and It allows not only for better strength, better range of motion, but better stability due to proprioceptive function of the muscles as well. Before, when we used the Charnley retractor, which is a type of retractor that pulls the muscles apart, by the end of the case, you take that out and the muscles have tears and, and it's just traumatizing. Instead, we use techniques that allow you just to very carefully split the muscle fibers apart so you can go through the muscle but not cut anything, and then put in very non-traumatic retaining type of material that or retractors that hold it apart. And so at the end of the case, it's a much different situation. The, the tendons and muscles just fall back together. The only closure really is this capsule, which is something you have to go through, but it's just an incision that you're able to bring back together and suture, which not only adds more stability, but it's more normal and not anatomy. So you're preserving normal anatomy and not traumatizing the tissue. I do notice a difference in the stability, and I notice it pretty much at time zero. Um, when we are shucking the hip uh, at, at the conclusion of the procedure, there's mi very minimal um, lack of tension uh, because you can, you can grade that fairly easily during the procedure. At the same time, I feel that I can range the patients any way I want and see exactly how, it's gonna, uh, how things are going to go postoperatively. So stability-wise, uh, even though with the anterior muscle sparing approach, the rate of dislocation is very low, same thing with the super path. If you have that acetabular position right where you see it should go, uh, patients are not going to dislocate. And that's where I feel most, uh, most patients have problems is that the acetabulum is not just in, in the right position. Any change in their alignment is going to make the hip dislocate. What I found with the super path is because we're not dislocating the hip, we're just moving everything out of the way, and we're reaming and broaching with the hip in position, I can follow the patient's natural version. And it gives me a little bit of a hint as to where that um, cup should go and where the, the neck or the angle should go to match the patient's anatomy so that we're not overcorrecting or undercorrecting their prior problems. And that, that's, one, that's one thing that I've seen that's very helpful. Some of the tests that I do intraoperatively to assess stability are, uh, are rotation. Um, so I'll put the uh, hip in, in various positions of internal rotation, abduction, um, and, and flexion too as well and, and address that, uh, address the stability and test the stability at that time. The other uh, test that I'll also use is soft tissue tension. What I've noticed with the SuperPath approach is that um, I'm able to accurately assess and, and better assess the soft tissue tension uh, with the SuperPath approach with the IT band still intact with all those rotators still intact and majority of the hip capsule still intact. You have a good, good understanding of what the hips tension and, and stability are um, with, them, with them still in place. Historically or traditionally, we give posterior dislocation precautions for posterior hips. There are some anterior precautions for anterior hips, and that's a method of, of uh, containing the hip and sort of helping the hip uh, heal in a manner that is no longer unstable after uh, surgery that requires uh, bigger dissection or even stretching of the soft tissue. Um, many cases, these uh, precautions are not permanent but they do impact the patient's lifestyle in a significant fashion, and they may have some minor lifetime restrictions like avoiding things like deep bends or yoga. Um, and with uh, kind of newer, more alternative techniques, we're able to get the patients back to these, um, these type of activities without restriction. Hip joint stability after, after superior hip approach, it's, it's clearly excellent both in surgery and after. We close the hip joint capsule anatomically from the socket rim right down to the shoulder of the prosthesis, which uh, confers great stability to the joint. And of course, we haven't released very much in the process. Most of the short rotators, if not all the short rotators, are intact. And so the hip has excellent range of motion, but also reaches an end range of motion where it does not dislocate. So after surgery, uh, 
we generally allow patients to put their hip in any position they want to without restriction. And the hip dislocation rate is as low or lower than any other technique that's available. I tend to use relatively small bearings and the hip dislocation rate is still less than one in 700. And I don't think there are any large series of more than 2,000 that have a hip dislocation rate that's lower than that.